So today we're going to talk about what happens in Quaker worship. And in the course of this talk, I will use the word God or the inward teacher to describe the transcendent. And you may use the word the light or the divine or the spirit and um, any of those words that describe the transcendent that's what i'm meaning when i use the word god um, i'm going to talk today uh, using a lot of quotes from robert barclay uh, robert barclay was a contemporary and friend of george fox and he wrote a very important book for uh, Quakers called The Apology. And this does not mean I'm sorry. It means uh, a defense of a proposition. And it's really helpful because what he was doing in it was trying to explain Quakers to other, what we would now call mainstream Christians. Of course, the stakes were very high because he was hoping they wouldn't be, say, locked up for heresy. But um, he, it's a really wonderful description of Quaker worship and practices because um, Quakers don't have a set of beliefs. So you have to describe what is happening. Um, so, um, the main thing to understand here is that I want to show using these quotes that Quaker worship has really been the same since the beginning. And there are differences between Quaker worship and other forms of Christian worship, but those differences grow out of the core truth of Quakerism. So it's not the format. We all love our format for worship, but in fact, there are very different formats. There are some Quakers who have uh, a sermon and have singing, and there are some Quakers who actually, you know, in, in Kenya, they rise up and dance as the spirit moves them. Um, but what is common in all Quakers that I have encountered is that they come together to experience the presence of the divine. And that is different from what I experience in most Christian worship. I grew up in a UCC church. I was a church goer. I enjoyed going to church. Um, and when I went to church, I found it uh, to be the, the worship in that context was somewhat uh, a, an amount of joy. I loved singing. Um, I was there to, to be part of praising. Um, I was mostly there, though, to learn. And as a matter of fact, the whole liturgy is really a big teaching tool. It's designed so that you go through all the most important parts of the Bible in the course of a year. And when um, a minister in that tradition reads from scripture, it's often called the lesson for the week or for the month. And that, and, and so um, part of what that worship is, is having somebody who's been trained explain to the congregation how this set of words, this book that was written thousands of years ago, literally, could have anything to do with our lives today. And it takes some training to do that. That is not what is happening in Quaker meeting. Barclay said, when people are thus gathered together, they do not merely meet to hear men or to depend upon them, but they are inwardly taught to dwell in their minds on the Lord and to await for his appearance in their hearts. So it's not about a lesson from a preacher. And what we do is sometimes called open worship. Some Quakers call it waiting worship. I like the term expectant worship 
And the reason I do is because when I worship, I'm not just opening up a space to, pl to pray. And I'm not just waiting with people for some event that's going to happen at some undetermined time in the future. It's not that kind of existential waiting, like waiting for Godot. It's actually waiting, expecting that we will encounter the divine in that room, in that time. We are expecting to hear God speaking to us internally or through our friends in that room. And that is who we're going to learn from. That is where we're going to gain wisdom. And the voice we hear in our heart or in our friends has the same authority as the voice that spoke to Moses and Isaiah and Jesus. The same authority as scripture. And that, my friends, is very radical. And it got early Quakers in a lot of trouble. But this encounter with the divine is something that is experienced. It's palpable. It's felt. Quaker worship touches our hearts before it touches our minds. And when we feel that it is true, we're not persuaded by logic or by well-constructed arguments that there's something there among us other than the people in the benches. Barclay said, for it was of his own experience, for it was not by the strength of arguments or by formal discussion of each doctrine in order to convince my understanding that I came to receive and bear witness to the truth, but rather it was by being mysteriously reached by this life. For when I came to the, assemble, the silent assemblies of God's people, I felt a secret power among them which touched my heart. And when I gave way to it, I found the evil in me weakening and the good lifted up. And you can see the feeling emphasis of this. He was reached. He felt something touched his heart. Now, when I first was among friends, I um, was a little disturbed by this. Um, I, after all, am the product of a liberal arts education and, Lord help us, law school. And I was finding it hard to accept this raising up of experience over intellect. It was actually a humbling experience for me. But I have come to find that this is core because this is why the truth is accessible directly and to everyone in our worship. God's wisdom may be spoken by folks without any formal education, as clearly as by a scholar. And that, again, is really radical. Another important thing that came out in the videos is that it's communal. We really can't do it alone. Quakers have always recognized that the sacred space is something that we create together. And Barclay says of that, Quakers meet together not only outwardly in one place, but inwardly in one spirit. And it is fundamentally a joint experience. God not only reveals himself and draws nigh to each individual, but is in the midst of the group as well. Each one partakes not only of the particular strength and refreshment which comes from the good in himself, but shares that of the whole body. This was really brought home to me when the virus came. And uh, churches everywhere of all kinds closed. And the mainstream Christian churches that had technology almost immediately turned to live streaming services over 
Facebook or on their web page or on other, uh, other platforms. It was really easy to create, to recreate the worship service. A minister and maybe a soloist could go to the sanctuary. You know, you put your iPhone on your tripod, you aim it towards the altar and the pulpit. There's a sermon, there can be hymns. And if you're, if you're at home in front of your computer, you know, you miss the fellowship, it's true. But the worship you're experiencing is almost exactly the same. Quakers all felt somehow that this technology was not going to work for them. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a rejection of technology. It was just impossible to see how this live stream thing could really help us in gaining a sense of communal worship. In our monthly meeting, in fact, what we decided to do was to all sit in our own homes at the same time as we usually meet and enter into worship together. And the first week that we did that, it was a wonderful experience for me. I sat and I pictured the meeting house and I could go from one corner around the whole meeting house and picture everyone there because you know, we are creatures of habit. We sit in our places in the meeting house. We know where we're gonna be. And I felt that presence. Um, and it was not in the same geographic space, but in the same spiritual space. And that was really wonderful. And then we discovered Zoom. And it's like God created Zoom so Quakers could worship together in the pandemic. Um, here's what uh, Barclay actually said about that experience of uh, joint worship. 350 years ago. We concur, come together with our persons as well as our spirits in believing that the maintenance of a joint and visual fellowship, the bearing of outward testimony of God, and the sight of the faces of one another are necessary. So these are the things you need for worship. You need a visible fellowship. You need a sense of fellowship. You need a bearing of an outward testimony for God, and you need to see the faces of these are friends. So the reason that live streaming didn't work for us was that we couldn't see each other's faces. We couldn't recreate that network that we feel sitting in meeting when it seems like everyone is connected all across every part of the room and in that net that's formed by that energy, that is where the sacred enters. And that sacred space begins with silence. Our form of worship centers on silence, but that silence to me is, it's not an emptying out. It's not even, it, it's not a draining. The image I have is it's sort of pushing the furniture to the corners, to the edges of the room so that the spirit can dance in the middle of the room. And we can all dance together there as well. The silence is very powerful, particularly in our day and age when everything is so busy and we are bombarded by sensory overload. Um, I often think of uh, my mother. My mother came to meeting only once. And I wasn't sure that she, a pretty conventional um, churchgoer, would sort of get what was going on. It was a fairly quiet meeting, too. There were only one or two messages. And so I was really didn't know. And she did. The presence touched her. As we were walking out, she said to me, that silence. I don't understand how anyone has the courage to break that silence. And yet we do. And we do because the words come from the same place as the silence. Worship consists neither in words nor in silences as such, but in a holy dependence upon the mind of God 
For such dependence, it is necessary to begin with silence until the words can be brought forth that arise from God's spirit. It's out of that space of silence that we hear a voice inside, an inward teacher, or we may be moved to speak in meeting. Now, vocal ministry is a super big topic. We could have a week workshop on it, and there have been many done, and so I'm not going to talk a lot about vocal ministry. I just want to make a couple of points. First of all, vocal ministry is not a sermon. And it's not just the length of messages that make a difference between vocal ministry and a sermon. Although we liberal friends often like to tell each other that longer messages are less likely to be from the divine, early friends spoke for hours. But I have to say the skepticism is warranted because vocal ministry is not prepared. It is given to us out of the silence by the divine in that place, in real time. We can't come in with a plan. It's not written out. And as a matter of fact, many of us have experienced the fact that after we speak, we don't remember exactly what we said because it doesn't come from our intellect. Nothing could be more unlike the natural, the nature and wisdom of human beings than is this silent waiting upon God. It can only be attained and correctly understood when man is about to set aside his own wisdom and will be content to be completely subject to God. We have to set aside our own wisdom to hear the messages. One other thing is about the difference between a message and a concern. For me, I see that difference as where the message, where it comes from. So for me, a message arises from the heart. It's informed by the head, but it arises from the heart. A concern arises from our intellect. It arises from our thoughts, not our feelings, and it is informed by our heart. And I use that sometimes to test whether something is a concern or a message. When Quakers first, early Quakers, were particularly moved by a message they heard from another in meeting, they would say to the speaker after meeting, we were well used. This underlines to me that our vocal ministry is not just a personal perspective, even a well-informed and thoughtful one. It is the transcendent being revealed. So I'm gonna take a minute to talk about um, a gathered meeting or a covered meeting, which Michael mentioned yesterday. And um, the images that we use to talk about this kind of meeting, which is a deep silence, is the image of the spirit gathering us together or holding us in a single embrace. The whole, it is a, it is a corporate experience of the divine, not just everybody having an experience of the divine individually at the same time. Sometimes people use the imagery of a covered meeting, of a, a great cloud of comfort or like a blanket covering and holding us all in its warmth. And like many other uh, parts of Quakerism, it's easier to describe than explain. So I thought I would give an example of a covered meeting that I actually attended. So it was a couple of weeks after 9-11. And um, so we're slipping into the late fall. The days are getting shorter. We're slipping into war. Friends were struggling with peace testimony 
and they were struggling with the fact that they were struggling with the peace testimony. And the messages that had been given earlier in the meeting were reflecting that despair, that alienation. And then there was a period of silence. And out of the silence, one friend began to sing a Christmas carol. O come, O come, Emmanuel. And you may remember that Emmanuel means God with us. And as it continued, more people joined in to ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here. And that's where we were. We were mourning and we were alone. Until the Son of God appear. And at this point, many friends all around the meeting were singing together. And when we hit the chorus, from all around the meeting came rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel will come to thee, O Israel. And there was silence. And everyone in that meeting felt we were not alone. We corporately were not alone. We felt the comforter had come to us. And that is what it feels like <laughs> to be in a gathered meeting. So just to uh, sum up here, Barclay says, if this form of worship, our Quaker worship, is observed, it is not likely to be kept pure unless it is accompanied by the power of God, for it is so naked in itself that there is little to tempt men to become excessively fond of its mean of its form once the spirit is removed. In other words, our form of worship is not only about feeling the presence, it clears everything away so that we will be directly and uncomfortably aware when the presence is not with us. Because literally, without that presence, there is nothing to Quaker worship.